Okay, go ahead, Liz. It's recording now. Wonderful. Right. Welcome to you all. Um, it's great to see a little crowd here again today on a Friday lunchtime for our Black History Conversation. And this week we're focusing on creating education and training opportunities for Africans in Wales, which is why I'd especially like to welcome Dr. Salamatu Fada, who is the uh, chair of the um, North Wales Africa Society. So here's our programme and we're just going to have a little look through that so you know what we're doing. So unfortunately, um, a colleague, David Alston, can't be with us today. Um, but uh, Simon, I don't know if you want to give us a quick update from Belong Nottingham. How are you doing there? We're doing fine. So just like to welcome everybody um, as co-hosts of this meeting. Uh, we're, I think, in interested from our side in learning more about the African Institutes because of the um, Congolese connections of our organization, which was founded by uh, people from the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and exist to support um, migrants, refugees in uh, settling in the UK. Brilliant then, thank you very much. And on from the Learning Links International point of view, and Caroline's here as well, she's one of the other directors of Learning Links International, it's a little team of us, and um, we're also starting a Black History Book Club, so we'll be letting people know about that soon. And that's quite an interesting thing so that we can find ways um, to share information about the, the different authors and the different materials there are. So what we're going to start off with, though, is uh, we're going to have a look at a film that was produced called The Remarkable Reverend William Hughes. It's a short film. It's about 10, 10 minutes or so, um, but it just tells the story and so that we can get started and we can um, begin to think about what we want to do next, which is to find out more about the African students who studied in North Wales. This is between, I think it was about 1890s to uh, about 19, 1907, I think, so period, something like that. Um, so uh, if we can have a look at that film, it would be great. It's uh, The narrator is a colleague of ours, Dr. Marianne Gwynne, um, and it was filmed by another colleague. So here it is. And I think if we make a start then, that would be great. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Okay, here we go. People have been coming to Colwyn Bay on the North Wales coast for a lovely week's holiday by the sea for decades. But I'm here to find out about a very different part of its history, when, just over a hundred years ago, Colwyn Bay was directly linked to the Congo in Africa. I'm here to look at the African Institute of Colwyn Bay, otherwise known as Congo House, because it was here over a hundred years ago that nearly a hundred students came from various countries of Africa to learn a whole range of skills. And they went back to Africa as missionaries, as teachers, as blacksmiths, as tailors, as printers, and a whole range of other things. And all of this was set up by one man, the remarkable Reverend William Hughes. Lovely to meet you. Hello. Hello. You're very well, thank you. Now then, Jean, you were the Reverend William Hughes's great granddaughter, and he went over to the Congo. He went out to the Congo as a Baptist missionary in 1882, and um, he was based here at Bainston in the Congo. And how did he relate to the people he met there? He worked very hard to improve the lives of people he met there and made some very special friends. And he saw Africans in a very different light to other missionaries, didn't he? Yes, he valued the culture and languages of Africa. He didn't want to turn Africa into Little England. 
And that was a very enlightened opinion in colonial Britain of the 19th century. Reverend Hughes wrote that, and I quote in his idea, training Africans as missionaries is that in all points they are like our brethren, of the same blood, the same humour, the same in everything, excepting in education and training. And he was determined to provide them with both those things. William Hughes returned to Britain when he became very ill with malaria in 1885. Hello, Pastor. He brought back with him Hello. His very first students. Uh, excuse me, I was uh, waiting cancer. to come. I don't know if I can come right now or not. What I'm finding out here Hello? is that the reason Reverend Hughes set up the African Institute in Colwyn Bay was so that he could train people from Africa who could work in Africa and who would therefore respect the communities they lived in and not try to change them. And this intrigues me. Why was William Hughes so aware of other people's languages and culture? To find out why, I need to know more about where he grew up and what influence this had on his life. Nan, give us tea to Vaggy and a rain artal at the hen, a wither. Do an artal printing on our pen, Carlo and Goy. Agen, hapal am rinningan, yn ardal brinningan, er, cafwyd yr ysgol sîl gynta yng Nghymru, sef yn mewn tu ffarm o'r enw Tyddyn Griffith. A mi oedd yr henewyrth William Hughes wedi cael ei fagu rhyw dair milltir i lawr y lôn yn yr ardal yma. A mi oedd ar Williams Parry yn bardd, yn byw yn talus arm. A mi oedd o'n canu am yr ardal yma. O lwc hagrwch cynnydd ar wyneb trys dy gwaith. Mae bro'r hwng mor am ynydd heb arnis dain a chraith. Ond lle byr arad ar y ffridd yn rhwygo'r gwanwyn per o'r prif. Ac am y cwmwnt yma oedd o'n. Yn digedig, beth yn ei rhywun mynd i mewn i'r capel? Syniad da. Cafodd o ei enni yn canol y pedwerydd ganrif ar bymffag. Pa fath o le o rhan ei diwylliant oedd Cymru yn yr amser hyn, a sut wnaeth hyn effeithio ar y llanc William Hughes? Ganwyd William Hughes mewn oes gyffrois yng Nghymru. Roedd creddu, diwylliant a barddoniaeth yn gyrydd iawn. Ac oedd o'n gwneud y cwbl yn ei famiaeth. Dyma'r ardal diwylledig lle y gallai William Hughes fynd i'r capel darllan i feibl, dadlaeth a gwneud y cwbl yn y Gymraeg. Mae o'n dweud yn ei lyfr da Caffrica yn the way out. Nad oes dim mwy achus na anadlu a nadl adra, a dyna beth oedd ei weled i'r gaeth. I ddod ar bechgyn o'r Congo i ddau colwn, fel ei bod nhw'n cael mynd adra i'r Congo. Ac oedd o'n, ac oedd o'n cydnabod nad oedd dylanwad cynyddol Lloegr Cymydog Mwy Cymru yn hollol fuddio i'w ramlad. Na'i ddarllan, fel mae o'n i roi to yn ei eiriau i hun yn ei lyfr. It is strong and a blunder to appoint Englishmen as judges, preachers and magistrates over the people of Wales. Even where they the best of men, they would be in the wrong place. They don't fit their place. They are square men in a round hall. They are ignorant of the Welsh language, unacquainted with affairs of the Welsh people, their poverty and their history. And so it was here that William Hughes became fired up to help others by becoming a missionary. 
but it was also from here that he learned to value the culture of other indigenous communities. But before he could become a missionary, he had to learn English so that he could attend the Baptist College. And being the determined man that he was, he worked as a farmhand in Cheshire and as a shop assistant in Manchester until he could speak English well enough to enter the Baptist College in Llangollen. And its principal clearly thought very highly of him, so highly in fact that he agreed to let William Hughes marry his daughter. And we know that William Hughes went out to the Congo in 1882, but he went out again, didn't he? Yes, he went out again to uh, recruit more students for the Institute in Colombe. And at that time, he wrote this book as well, Dark Africa on the Way Out. Rwan, pam danny fy yma a beth gyn y parch William Hughes i wneud gyda'r safle yma fy yma? Mae da ni'n sefyll yn bar ceirias yn bai colwyn wrth geri gyrorsen ac e blaw bod uh, William Hughes yn gysylltiedig gar Congo Institute oedd o hefyd yn cymryd rhan yn y diwylliant ar iaith Gymraeg yn lleol a fodd ysgrifennydd cyffredinol Steddfod Genedlithol Cymru, un naw, un dim. Reverend Hughes never forgot his Baptist ministry either, and he set up this tabernacle chapel in 1888, and it initially supported both the Welsh and the English Baptist congregations in Colwyn Bay. And while the Reverend Hughes was involved in all this work in the community, he was also ensuring that Congo House was going from strength to strength. Well, I'm outside here. This is Paulson's Printing Works in Colwyn Bay, and it was here over a hundred years ago that some students from the African Institute came to learn how to be printers. And it was in places like this, all around Colwyn Bay, where the students from the Institute learned a whole range of valuable skills to take back with them to Africa. The African Institute ran for 22 years until it finally closed its door in 1912. Now Jane, William Hughes fought hard to keep the Institute going. Why did it close? It had always faced opposition, not least from the Baptist Missionary Society itself, who sent William Hughes over there in the first place. And you have a letter here from one of William Hughes's missionary friends who says that the uh, Missionary Society actually wants to crush William Hughes if he carries on with his work. Because apparently it is missionary policy to change Africans, to change their culture, so that they become more like Europeans. Also against him was what we would call today the tabloid press. They hated the fact that the black male students were forming consensual relationships with white women. Financial support for the Institute, which was dependent on public contributions, fell in the face of such opposition, no matter to what lengths Reverend Hughes went to keep the Institute going, and he fought very hard to keep it open. It was brought down by racism against the students and by personal vindictiveness against the Reverend Hughes himself. 
After the Institute closed, the Reverend William Hughes decided to return to the Congo in 1917. And he wasn't going to go alone because he wanted to take with him 2,000 hymn books in the Cameroon language, the first time a hymn book had been produced in an indigenous African language. And the people of Colwyn Bay knew that they were about to lose somebody very, very special. And we know this because they presented him with something really rather spectacular to take with him. And I'm going to look at that now. Wow, Jane, this is spectacular. Yes, it is, isn't it? It truly is an amazing citation uh, given to him <coughs> by the Council of Colwyn Bay. If you read this paragraph here. After a residence of 30 years among us, during which you have rendered invaluable services to the town on councils, committees, and the nationalist abroad, preaching, lecturing, etc., in England, Ireland, and in the Principality, crowned with your magnificent efforts on behalf of Africa, we, the undersigned, exceedingly regret your departure. That is such a powerful statement. Yes, it is. Who signed it? it it's signed by ministers of the gospel in Colin Bay and outlying areas, and by councillors, magistrates, doctors, etc. What a wonderful citation. Reverend Hughes never made his third journey to the Congo. The dangers of travelling by sea during the First World War, with British shipping being the target of German U-boats, made the voyage impossible. The legacy of Reverend Hughes's Congo house shines out when you see what his students did when they left the Institute to return to Africa. There's one student we haven't mentioned so far, and he's possibly the most famous. Tell me about him. Yes, his name was Davidson Don Tengo Jabovu, who returned to South Africa. He was one of the founders of Fort Hare College. Now, Fort Hare College is very important because it was the first higher education institute in South Africa to educate black students and he mentored one very special student over there. Jean, tell me about him. Yes, that was Nelson Mandela, who went on to be, as we know, the first black president of South Africa. Now, Jean, not all the students made it back to Africa, did they? No, sadly a few did die and are buried here in Colwyn Bay. Newspapers of the day tell us that the people of Colwyn Bay turned out in their droves to attend the funerals of the four students who never made it back to Africa. While these graves are an important part of Welsh history, they also fill a very special place in the hearts of those in Africa. And the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo still visit their ancestors today. I've 
learnt a lot about the Reverend William Hughes and the African Institute he set up here in Colwyn Bay. We live in a world now where attitudes towards those we see as different is hardening and yet the vision that the Reverend William Hughes had in recognising and respecting difference and helping those when he thought he could help them is absolutely special and it's something that we desperately need in the world around us today. He was truly a very good man. Right, thanks very much, Simon. Um, I hope you can hear me now. So that was the film that was produced. I'm just so grateful to uh, Dr. Marion Gwynn and to Dear Evans um, and to Nan and Jean, um, Reverend William Hughes's um, relatives. So it was um, great that we had that opportunity. It was funded by Colwyn Bay Town Council and it has been shown um, by the, um, the local historical society who are very interested as well. But it all began very interestingly because, I don't know, um, I can see the big screen now, but there was a book produced called Scandal at Congo House. And that was, um, we used that as, uh, as the, the Black History Reading Book of the Month in about 2000 and 15 perhaps 15 16 and a group in colwyn bay took it upon themselves to to read that and to uh, to take um take notice of, uh to learn about the story um that was the first step then the next step was to um to move on to uh produce that film because we realized that um the relatives of Reverend William Hughes had never had their chance to tell the story. And because this book, although it's a very informative book, very, very interesting, very well written and well illustrated, um, the, the uh, Jean and Nan as, as direct descendants hadn't had an opportunity to tell their part of the story. So um, what, we, uh, what we wanted to do was to let them have their chance. So that was how the film came about. And I'm really pleased because one of the things that Learning Links International does is that we help families with very difficult histories. And that's quite interesting. And communities with very difficult histories. Um, so anyway, so that, was, that was the film. Um, and what we're hoping to do, and Salama too, I know you need to go any minute, you've got an appointment. Um, so I, I'm hoping that the... Um, our friends in the North Wales Africa Society uh, will pick up on this idea and hopefully we can discuss it at the next committee meeting so that we can have a look at the stories of the students, a hundred African students who came and studied here in North Wales. What do you think Salama too? Can you unmute yourself? Um, thank you, Liz. It's, it's quite interesting. I, I found it and I found the video on um, YouTube and have watched it previously, but it's such a rich story. I enjoyed watching it again this afternoon. Um, I think that, yes, we can take it. We can take it, definitely take it forward. Um, if we are able to have all the names, I think all the names of the students at the time, yeah. Are still there. Yeah, yeah. They're in the Even book, though some of them have died, many of them have died, or all of them. Yes, they've all died now, yes. All of them have died. It's very possible to trace them since we have their names and have their countries. 
we in um, North Wales Africa Society now, we have um, our members from over 10 countries, right. our active members from over 10 countries. So it's yeah. very possible to be able to trace um, such history. So, so we, we are happy to discuss it at the next meeting. Unfortunately, our, our time and Lizzie's time are poles apart. <laughs> But if you can come on the meeting, it will be nice, or we can arrange a meeting of, um, of the education subcommittee. Yeah. And then we can actually explore um, our, our ideas, try to see how we can develop our ideas, other ideas and develop them, and see what we can do with all the information we have, and then see how we can push it forward. Definitely. It's very interesting. Well, I think that sounds absolutely brilliant. And um, thank you very much, Salama, too. So I look forward to linking up with you again. And have a happy rest of your birthday week, Salama, too. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. It was nice to meet you. I have um, an appointment with my optician. I have to go now. Okay, but it was then. nice to meet everyone. Bye. Thank you again, Salama, too. That's no problem. Lovely, lovely. Okay, so I was just going, well, first of all, I'm going to say, Norbert, I'm delighted to see you. And yeah. uh, Jean Samuel, I'm delighted to see you too. Okay, so that's really brilliant. Norbert, it's good to, good to see you there. I think that's a, a photograph. Uh, oh, here he is live. Jolly good, Norbert, well done. Right, um, I think now we might just, um, just ask you, Norbert, because you... Um, can I just introduce you, Norbert? Norbert um, has worked, um, come up to North Wales, or gone up to North Wales on many occasions. I met with Gwyneth, um, looking at the story of Henry Morton Stanley. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But Norbert, you also worked with colleagues in London to do a project about the story of the Reverend William Hughes and the African Institute. Norbert, would you be able to tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so hello everyone, I'm very happy. <laughs> Presently I'm talking to you from Paris. Oh, I really, uh, came quickly because we are trying to, uh, um, the Francophone and the Congolese community, trying to think our involvement in Black Lives Matters because right. we are not uh, listening enough uh, about uh, the Francophone side of the stories. And right. um, from my side, coming from uh, Welsh, uh, I'm bringing the Congolese side of the story of Henri Morton Stanley, of Reverend Hughes, and uh, especially all the uh, missionary who really went um, in Africa on behalf of um, David Livingston, and especially because this we are not emphasizing about the big positive job uh, those people they did in our countries, the sacrifice they made leaving Europe, going in Africa a century ago. So we say it's important for us to not only to mention about uh, the negative side of uh, the colonization of the, the slave trade, but because as Barack Obama said that uh, the, the history is made by the collusion of people, the collusion of culture, the collusion of history. Why not learning from the positive sides of this connection, this wonderful connection we have now? When I'm, I'm in North Welsh, it looks like I'm in my home. So, and, uh, so uh, when I say to, my, to many people that I never experienced racism since I'm in Europe, people, they look at me and say, no. It's my story. I never experienced racism. I don't know what that means. I know that it's happened. So why not taking those positive sides? And uh, so we are meeting now in Paris and uh, I will come back there with some resolution, especially because the Congolese uh, community in London just published the first Congolese manifesto. And we want really to make official a date where we need to come in North Welsh to celebrate Reverend Yuge and the Congo boys. And that will be a kind of uh, Congo uh, uh, days in Britain. 
So now we are working on it. And the, oh, the history of the Congo boys and the Reverend youth is a, a, a Welsh pastor who went in Africa, came back in Africa in 1884 uh, with two boys, okay. set up in Kolyung Bay. And he, the, the first Pan-African project, because it was the first time in history that African people could live together. That was in Kolyung Bay. And the, 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 the project was known as the Congo and African Institute of Welsh ran from 1891 to 1912. And the, the project was funded, uh, uh, supported by Henry Morton Stanley also, who lectured in Canada from um, Castle, the money was for the project. So all those positive side of the story is one we want to bring, what we want to learn from those people. So this is really just to cut short the story. and. Uh, Liz, thank you very much because every time you welcome us, every time you help us, every time you direct us, every time you network us. I don't remember how many times I've been with you in a meeting in, in Cardiff. <laughs> so thank you very much. So this is just for an introduction. Well, thank you very much indeed, Norbert. And it's great to hear that we've got, you know, links around around the world. Yeah. Um, uh, so you're in... in um, in Paris, just to explain to you that the co-host of this program is, uh, or our session here, is uh, Simon Pringo from Belong Nottingham, which is a Congolese-based group. Simon, mm. you just want to introduce yourself to Norbert. Yes, yes. Uh, so I run the, the Heritage Program. Hello, Norbert. Uh, I run the Heritage Program at Belong. So Belong was founded by Congolese refugees who wanted to help other, other people to settle later on. Uh, and we've just been working our recent project is on the African Companions of David Livingstone. Oh, yeah. So three of them came to Nottingham in 1874. Came to Nottingham, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So would love to to talk to you more and unfortunately it looks like Albert uh, has had to go because Albert is from the uh, DRC uh, and was very interested in the film today and I know he he saw that and then he's had to go to work I think so I would love to have a conversation with you about how we can work together because we want to explore next Jacob Rainwright's diary mm -hmm. uh, which only exists in French these mm -hmm. days yeah. because he talks about the journey of the, the Africans bringing Livingston's body back to Zanzibar and then about his visit in the UK yeah. where he met Queen Victoria. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also hoping soon to have somebody talking about bark cloth, which Jacob Rainwright mentions, which is a tra mm -hmm. traditional African fabric mm -hmm. made from uh, tree fiber. And uh, a friend of mine from Uganda has been reviving that and using it in fashion accessories and clothing. Uh, yeah, thank you. All right, that's great. Well, that's really good because one of the things that um, we're able to do is to put people in contact. And uh, uh, I know for our sp first speaker um, a couple of weeks back was uh, Dr. Morgan Dalfinis. He was speaking about St. Lucian language. And that was really interesting because there were several people that contacted him afterwards and, and wanted to, to make the links there. So we'll try and follow through all these different things and I'm looking forward to our fabrics session when we can also include that talk on bark cloth that's really interesting Simon really interesting so Norbert um brilliant that you're here um maybe we haven't got time well are you okay to stay on with us Norbert for a bit yeah 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 okay. I took a break because I want to really uh because I will come back after tomorrow I just came yesterday and uh, after tomorrow I come back so we got just we have a meeting yesterday and today and tomorrow I come back yeah so yeah. okay so um how are we fixed have a look at um some of Jean Samuel's paintings this week Simon did we get that organized we did so I'm going to share my screen again and we'll show those okay, um this would be lovely and whilst you Simon's just doing that Caroline's reporting to me uh, that she's been having difficulties but she's saying she can see things now Okay, no, I'm not. Yeah, still. not sure what happens, but no, no. yeah. All right. Okay. So, Jean, uh, Fickleton Jean Michel has joined us uh, because he's our artist in residence. Jean Michel, are you there? You may need to unmute Jean Samuel. Well, he may need to appear in the picture. 
he is there. Jean yeah. Samuel, are you there? Jean Samuel. Yeah. Slight technical pitch here. I'll carry on talking till Jean Samuel gets off the phone or whatever he's doing. Uh, um, making a cup of tea or? <laughs> absolutely. Um, so, no, but it's just brilliant that, um, as I say, you, you were able to share that. So when we've had a chance to have a look at Jean Samuel's pictures, because we've got those up on the screen now, um, it would be good to hear about that project in London. Are you able to talk about that? No, but where have you gone? Norbert? <laughs> Norbert, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, when, when we've had a look at Jean Samuel's pictures, um, yeah. paintings, can you tell us a bit about the project um, that you were involved in with the group in London? Yeah, um, in fact, uh, um, what we, we, we are now doing with the group in London is uh, so what we did um, around this story of uh, um, uh, Reverend Hughes and Henri Morton Stanley, it was right. really to link the Congo no, link. But, yeah. No, but I'm going to be very rude. I think we've got Jean Samuel back now. Yeah, Jean okay. Samuel, are you ready to talk about your pictures? Yeah. Can you unmute yourself? John Samuel, can you unmute yourself and tell us about your pictures then? Yeah, okay. No, yes. Yes, I think. Yeah, okay, Jean Michel, uh, Jean Samuel, can you tell us then? Samuel, sorry, Jean Samuel, can you yes. <laughs> tell us about your, your, the paintings you've chosen to share with us this week? So Jean, Jean Samuel is from, um, from the Democratic um, I'm from Ka I'm from Cameroon. From Cameroon. 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 Get my African countries right. I do apologise. Um, so tell us about this this gorgeous painting. Um, well, is everyone getting me? Yeah. Hello. Yes, Hello. I can hear you. Yep. How we feel? All right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. This painting is called "Unzipping the African Potential." Unzipping the African Potential. Um, I I was pondering sometimes ago because Africa has a lot of resources, and um, but I don't understand why after 50 years of independence or more than many African countries cannot still be sustainable even in food production. Before talking about technological development, many resources used in the West. For the production of some um, uh, technological, like um, like gadgets, uh, even from Africa, like the Quatem, from um, Democratic Republic of Congo, and other resources. So I was like, what is it that Africa is not like moving forward? What is happening to them? So I thought that they needed someone to unzip the African potential. If you look inside, there is a woman who is pregnant. That is like African potential. Like we need somebody to open it up so that that woman can give birth to a new Africa that everyone desires. Because if Africa gets forward, the world gets forward and everyone goes forward. So the hand in front is the potential facilitator. That could be you and that could be me. It could be anybody. It could be an African leader anywhere in the world. But there was one leader in mind that I had when I was doing this painting. There's a guy in Rwanda called Paul Kagame. He has taken his country from the, from the, from, 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 from after a genocide to become one of the most uh, prosperous countries in Africa. And uh, he, he has been doing a lot of things for Africa and African immigrants. There was a time he went to Libya and uh, took the stranded Africans back home. He told them, come back and let's build Africa together. He was able to launch the first smartphone in Africa and many other things. Rwanda is like the cleanest, one of the cleanest cities. I mean, their capital is one of the cleanest cities in the world. So I was thinking about him as well when I was doing this painting. So maybe that is his hand, but it can also be your hand. This hand is the hand of anybody who wishes well for Africa in good faith and who thinks that African resources should also have um, compassion for Africa before feeding the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is all about this painting. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, this one was just a symbolic pen. Hello? Yeah. Hello, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, yeah, this one is a symbolic painting of um, an African woman because uh, an African woman, including my mother, is one of the most powerful women in the world. They are embodied with a lot that we can ever imagine. So this is not maybe practically true, but theoretically, this is what our mothers do because they, they, they just do a lot and they are just everything for the family. So I thought I should um, do this in reverence, I mean, to revere my own mother, who I have a lot of respect for. I think I've been able to achieve many things in my life because this woman refused to surrender. There was a lot for her to give, give up. Uh, she had a lot of reasons to give up, but she refused to give up just for me. So it, this pending is in respect of my mother, and I'm happy to share it with everyone in the world. That's great. Thank you. That's yeah. really good. Now, now, sometimes I try to, sometimes I try to coin traditional painting that are revered in the world in my own African texture. There is a famous painting called The Girl with the Pearl, he Pearl Earring. The Girl with the Pearl er Earring. If you go to internet or Google, you can see that painting. So this is my own version of the girl with the pearl earring. Earring. So I have loved that painting since I was a child. It was very realistic, but I decided to put an African mask touch to it, like Picasso did sometimes in his life. He decided to paint uh, certain things with the African touch, African mask touch, because at the root of my inspiration is the African mask. So sometimes I convert traditionally known paintings to an African mask. Uh, yeah, so that they can look like an African mask in one way or the other. All right, thank you. Well, th this is part of a series of paintings that I'm doing called My Heritage. My Heritage. This painting just has too much of what happens in my culture. Uh, it's part of the, it's a virtual encyclopedia. It tells the stories of my connections with my ancestors. At the root of my inspiration is the African mask because a lot of people don't understand that the African mask is not only a symbol of... Uh, they think that the African mask is only a symbol of entertainment and... Um, yeah, of entertainment. But no, it's not so. It embodies what appears on top because it, it embodies the spirit of the African ancestors. I always try to put the African mask in most of my paintings because when I was a child, we had special reverence to the African mask. And through them, we were able to see our great-grandfathers, our great-grandmothers. We saw artifacts that have been made centuries ago. And this reminded us how ingenious they were, how much they traveled. Our history was written in symbolic forms. So I continue to write the history of my people, of my nation in symbolic form now, even in this part of Wales. And I'm happy to share this story with anybody that wants to listen. It's really a bit a different kind of art to that one, the one that prevails here. But I think that any artist has that originality and that power to tell his story as he wants. The world is a blank canvas to me. And I hope that people can also stop and listen to the relevance of African art from me, telling the African story story from an authentic source. So this one is called My Heritage. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That was wonderful, Jean Samuel. Um, you're a real inspiration. Your work is incredible and so so detailed in in many of your paintings. And you have have different styles of painting, which is absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much. That was that was fabulous. I really really appreciate it and. Uh, and we'll continue to, to discuss how we can, can promote arts and culture in our shared history. Um, no. well, this is African history. This isn't shared. This is African. <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you so much. That's Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. You're welcome. Now, um, I'm just going to say I'm absolutely delighted to see that Professor Sati has joined us from Nigeria from Jos in Nigeria and this is fabulous so so I'm just going to ask Professor Sati to 
introduce himself and uh, we'll just carry on with the other things that we want to pick up on as well during this session. Wonderful, Professor Sati. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Just about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn my volume on. Am I muted? No, no, we can hear you. Can hear you. Okay, just to say hello from Joss. I'm in a very noisy place, so I, that's why I have a headphone on, so that the noise um, from my background will not escape into what you are doing. I'm happy to be here. I came late though, but I'm enjoying every bit of what I'm listening to. Hello to everybody and have a nice workshop. I will be with you for some time. Greetings. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Sati, um, Professor Sati, you've just missed Salamatu Fada. She had to leave earlier. Okay. Yeah, because Salamatu put me in touch with you. Yeah, I'll be expecting the messages. Okay, no problem. That's fine. Great. Okay, then. Thanks ever so much. We're delighted. So we're getting, getting a worldwide uh, crowd. I'll have to phone up... Uh, our Jamaican colleague and see if he's going to be able to join us as well in a few moments. But uh, now we just wanted to go on to just pick up a few other threads from what we were talking about before, after seeing those fabulous paintings. Um, and one of the threads was that um, uh, an incredible artifact was found during our research into the uh, story of the African Institute in Colwyn Bay. Now, Africans came from all over Africa. They're often called the Congo boys, but many came from Nigeria, came from South Africa, came from Sierra Leone. There's a, oh, there was a real um, spread across Africa and they were able to travel. They, they were given free, free travel by the Elder Dempster line um, to get up to Liverpool. So, um, the incredible thing that we found was that someone contacted us to say they had an autograph book. And the autograph book has entries handwritten by students at the African Institute between um, 1900 probably and about 1907. Now this was an incredible find and it's, it's the original is still with its owner who can trace her family story back to Colwyn Bay and her great great grandfather was um, a colleague of Reverend William Hughes and I suspect that Reverend William Hughes gave some of his most precious things to this colleague um, because his own family were not too um, close to him in his latter years, sadly. So Caroline is going to uh, read a, one of the entries. And this entry is, Caroline, are you there? Caroline, right, let's check you. Caroline, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Good. I have, yeah. Oh, lovely. Caroline, another of the directors of Learning Links International. She's showing you a large version. This is... um. This is photocopies of the pages, right? But we can't really see that clearly. But what she's going to do, is she's going to read an entry from Davidson Jabavu. And I'll just tell you Davidson Jabavu's story first of all. He came from South Africa. He studied at the African Institute and probably other places in the UK. And this is why we want to do some more research into this. And then he went back to South Africa and he um, eventually... Um, because he was born in King Williamstown, Cape Colony in 1885. So on his return to South Africa, he became a lecturer and an anti-apartheid activist, but he also became the founder of Fort Hare College, which is where we saw on the video, we saw that photograph of Davidson Jabavu, where um, Fort Hare College was where Nelson Mandela trained. So Caroline, can you read us what um, Davidson Jabavu wrote, and we think that the autograph book belonged to uh, Reverend William Hughes's daughter, who would have been in her early 20s at the time. Yeah, That's this coming. is called Faith and Love. Beautiful handwriting. The darkened chamber held the maiden dead. Her name was Faith. Of long neglect she died. 
And now men rose and shook themselves and cried, O oh, faith, come back, come back ere hope be fled. But she lay silent on her solemn bed. And men grew piteous at their prayer denied. They said, No more is man to man allied. We fall asunder and the world, they said. And while they talked, behold, a gracious form. We live and die together, she and I. So then he kissed her, and her flesh grew warm. She woke and faced them with a ruddy glow. If love be living, faith can never die. And this is signed Davidson Jabaru, King Williamstown, Cape Colony, South Africa. Wow, remarkable. Um, is, does anybody want to ask any questions or add anything at this point? Uh, no, um, I think I think uh, Liz, this is a <laughs> this is an interesting piece of uh, archive. Hmm? Uh, to 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 have it uh, on your hands, huh? I think is a. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how we can. Is a is a kind of gold <laughs> to keep really, and. I, how can you react, you know, when you have all those words, those deep words from those deep heart of those people who benefit from this incredible, remarkable project. So thank you very much for finding this piece. We will really travel there to read it. Huh? And really a good job for that. Hmm. Wonderful. Here's thank one you. Of the illustrations. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it is a true autograph book. It's got all sorts of little entries in. And the lady who um, who actually owns it, she's called Gwyneth as well. Um, she's, um, she's keen that it goes either into the archive at Bangor University or that it goes into the archive at Conwy. And there's a discussion at the moment as to where will be the most appropriate place for it to go. So Norbert, did you want to just tell us a little bit about your, um... oh, can yeah. we have a look at the Henry Morton's, no, tell us first of all about the project in, in London. Yeah, um, after our last project uh, uh, connected uh, the Congolese community with the remarkable uh, Reverend Youth project in North Wales, there is a, a kind of an awareness now in the Congolese community that uh, we have something to celebrate. So, um, because this year uh, you have uh, 17 African countries celebrating their uh, 60th anniversary of their independence. And because of the life, um, uh, Black Life Matters, so the Congolese community just published the first manifesto uh, in London. And in this manifesto, um, that was around the 60th anniversary of our independence is, uh, yes, we need to celebrate our independence, but we need to celebrate also our roots and uh, our connection, our roots, not only our roots back home, but our roots here in the United Kingdom. So the best way to do it is to connect to our young people and our diaspora to our, the root of our history. And the, the root of our history in the United Kingdom is via the Congo Boys and the Reverend Youth Project in Kolung Bay. So now we agree to uh, choose a date, uh, the, the 5th or the 10th of May. That was the, when the first Congo Boys was, uh, died in Kolung Bay. So the Congolese uh, um, coordinator, community coordinator will officially write to Kolung Bay so that with the embassy to set up a meeting to check uh, in which way we can make it as to, be, to become the Congo days in the, the United Kingdom. But around the Congo um, uh, um, uh, and the uh, UK history, as we mentioned, uh, you know, this story of the um, David Livingstone disciple who, when they came to, uh, uh, in Britain, they, they, they spent time in Nottingham, huh? where really they contributed in the translation of um, um, Livingstone uh, uh, diary. Huh? 
But uh, those two disciples became of the disciples of Henry Morton Stanley. So the, it was the guys who make successfully the, the second journey of Henry Morton Stanley in the Congo, uh, in Africa and in Congo. And there was one of them was uh, the guy Henry Morton Stanley sent with a letter to, to drop in Kenya in the, the them uh, um, uh, company to rescue them. So this kind, those of kind of story need to be known by uh, um, not only the Congolese, but by the African community living in Britain. And we, we got also the link now with the uh, um, uh, Uganda diaspora because you know, the history of the Christianity in Uganda is a uh, remote understanding when you arrive in Uganda, he sent his article to Daily Telegraph, requested to send the first missionary there. So that was the first uh, Protestant missionary who went in uh, Uganda. And then the Catholic missionary came after, and we got this is the Saint Martha of Uganda who came after on behalf of this uh, appeal of Henry Morton Stanley. And there will be now a big celebration between Uganda uh, and um, the, the, the city, the French city of this Catholic father who was uh, in, uh, in Uganda, Father Lourdel. So now Uganda community will celebrate Henry Morton Stanley, not only in Uganda, but also in France. And they want now to link with wealth so the aim of the, what we are doing now in, in London is to raise awareness. Uh, we know, we know that, you know, we have a lot of bad stories about uh, the colonization, about the slave trade, about, yeah. But we think that why not uh, speaking much more about the positive side of those people who uh, from side on another made positive contribution in what we, we are now uh, living. So this is really the project we are now trying to think from London, not only the Congolese community, but the Uganda community, the Tanzanian community, uh, the Angola community. So this is, uh, we are still uh, working on it, but uh, the manifesto have been already published. The coordinator will um, uh, send the copy officially to Bangor and Kolung Bay, and they will check in which way we will travel there again to have a meeting and the idea is, I mentioned to them about what you did, that why not thinking about a symposium? You remember what you organized in uh, Kolung Bay, the symposium? Why not uh, resuming the symposium so that it will be the way to have those, uh, you know, piece of stories to put together. So this is where we are now. Well, no, but we're thinking of the same hymn sheet this is the online version of the symposium. So, yeah, yeah. Right. Thanks. So we, we have met over the last few years in Colwyn Bay Town Hall, and Simon from Belong Nottingham was one of the presenters, I think, a couple of years ago. And Simon should have been presenting about with his colleagues about Belong Nottingham's story of the um, Africans who brought David Livingstone's body back to the UK. Um, and because we couldn't do that, we began to talk together. And that's what these lunchtime conversations are. But because we're going to continue them all through the year, we've got plenty of time to explore different threads, different stories. So I think you're absolutely right. And um, we think lunchtime is the, probably the best time to do this. Um, so that's fine. That's um, that that that's a really good idea. So thank you. So Simon, can I ask you? Can you put on the photograph that Gwyneth sent us, please? Now, All right? We'll get that in a moment. There we are. Main <clears throat> one. Right. Okay then. Right. Um, <laughs> And thank you very much indeed to Jean Samuel. Thank you very much for uh, your contribution. I realise you have to leave now. That's fine. No problem at all. So last week, Gwyneth and um, was talking with us. That's Gwyneth in the middle with the glasses on. Um, Gwyneth was talking about um, uh, the story of Henry Morton Stanley and why she felt so passionately about the story and uh, why she wanted to uh, 
have a statue of Henry Morton Stanley actually in Denby. Now, if you look at the uh, very right-hand side behind the statue, there's Norbert. Okay, then we've got the, was it Mayor and Mayoress, Gwyneth? Gwyneth, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, it's the, the, it's the Mayor of Denby, and yeah. then I was Chair of Denbyshire County Council, right. and the, the woman in pink was my consort. All right, yeah. And so we were there as ch chair and uh, consort of Denbyshire County Council, and then that was the mayor. Yes. And, and then Norbert, Norbert can make... Do introduce the other people on the photograph? Gwyneth? Norbert yeah. can do that. Uh, yeah. I can start from the left side. Uh, so from the left side, we have uh, uh, Chief Thomas, uh, which is uh, one of our elder uh, in the community in London. Um, yeah. Thomas was running the first ever Congolese project in London called Cocorico. Cocorico is really, as you can listen, is the how the, really the cocoa uh, making wake up people in the morning. And it was just to say to Congolese people, look, you are living in this uh, beautiful, welcome country. You need to wake up. And so Thomas is doing a lot of things in London and around, now linking the Congolese with back home. And uh, after Thomas, uh, we have uh, 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 one of the advisors of um, uh, uh, Madame Kafenge, who was the, uh, our former, um, Charge d'affaires of the embassy, Papa Kalala, and then the second pe person uh, just behind uh, the charge d'affaires is uh, uh, Chief Thomas uh, um, uh, Second, is uh, the uh, vice coordinator of his project. Um, and uh, I mean, the other side just behind uh, the statue of Henri Morton Stanley. Uh, and this picture now is really ever been copied. I, I, I can't say to uh, uh, Gwyneth that uh, most of the picture now have been copied by the Congolese archive project in Kinshasa. Uh, they will send a, an official request to, if they can have a permission to print it uh, uh, and then to, to stick it in uh, the um, official archive project uh, in Kinshasa, because now we have for the first time, the first museum built by the Korean in Kinshasa. So many, many of those things, they want also to have a special compartment for the diaspora. And uh, they wanted to start with the, the UK diaspora, which seems to be a little bit more rooted in digging uh, this connection history. That's excellent. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks ever so much, then. That's just fascinating. So, Gwyneth, do you want to tell us a little bit more about this, uh, this occasion? Um, well, I think this was organised by Norbert uh, and Chief Thomas, but I think it was Norbert mainly um, who had tried to get the Chargé d'Affaires up to Denby. And uh, so the delegation came up and there were presentations with the town council. And um, then she, I think she came up quite a few times in fact. And, uh, but the first time I met Norbert was many, many years previously when, before there was a statue here and he had come, I'd been contacted by the count, someone in the county council saying there was someone at the castle in Denby um, from the Congo uh, and would I be able to meet him? And that's how we first met. And, Norbert was so full of enthusiasm and uh, he couldn't believe uh, in fact that he was standing in the place where Stanley lived near the castle and uh, it's a lot has developed since then uh, as I'm sure you're, you're aware there's a lot of negativity 
um, and uh, controversy, but that's because, yes, he was controversial in his time. Uh, he made uh, enemies uh, among the establishment because he beat the people from the Royal Geographical Society in, in finding the source of the Nile, uh, also in finding Livingston and uh, that period of time they were full of uh, of um, jealousies and of course the link with uh, Leopold but what pe so people are quite happy to jump on that link with Leopold what they will not or what they don't want to hear is that Stanley was sacked by Leopold because Stanley would not um, carry out the treaties that Leopold wanted and he said no uh, we are here this is the, the chief's lands we are here passing through and that of course did not satisfy Leopold at all so that's briefly it thank you very much indeed thank you Gwyneth now um, Professor Sati, if you unmute yourself, can you tell us about this uh, this book that you use with your students? Professor Sati is a professor of history at Just University. You need to unmute yourself. Professor Sati, can you unmute yourself? Right, well, Professor Sati is unmuting himself. Simon, can you help? Yeah, I've just asked him to unmute. Right. Okay, and it, here we okay. are. Um, so, what do you? Yeah, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear can you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Thank okay, you. what do you want me to respond? What do you want me to respond um, to? The book that you, you've just put in the chat um, that you use a book called The Archives of the Empire, and you were saying yeah. that you use, tell us about it. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I bought a copy of uh, Archives of Empire in which uh, a lot of uh, colonial discourses uh, are presented. The works of Lord Lugard, uh, Stanley Motley, Red Ren Hughes, uh, Geoffrey Conrad, and so on. So I find it very interesting narrative about how um, Europeans at that time uh, had perceptions of Africa as the dark continent. Of course, uh, the dark continent, uh, in the views of George Conrad, meant that Africa was not known to the rest of the world, uh, in their opinion. And of course, uh, Africa was not known so much known to the European world. But more fascinating uh, is the fact that um, Stanley, as well as uh, Livingston, were said to have discovered uh, various parts of Africa. And of course, uh, for the European world, that represented major, major inroads, uh, major discoveries. And for the Reverend, uh, his Reverend Hughes, for example, his perception about Africa was that of uh, a continent that was not known to Jesus Christ coming from a Christian background. And if you see the subtitle of his work, it was how they could get Africa onto the path of civilization. So the book is, uh, the book is quite amusing to me and quite uh, interesting to me because I, I'm trying to reconstruct the perceptions of Africa in the European world. And I find such perceptions of the 19th century quite interesting as Europeans try to know more and more about Africa. Of course, that was their own knowledge system. Africans have tried to say, no, these representations are, are, are Eurocentric. But of course, um, that is because uh, Europeans had no much knowledge about Africa. And what they knew were the kinds of people they met at that time. And the kind of people they met at that time in the views of uh, Catherine Cooper Vidorovich, who are not the Africans in their pristine qualities to use her word. This was Africa that had already been devastated by over 400 years of the slave trade and some other years of the legitimate trade. So the European perception of Africa at that time represented a misrepresentation in the sense that they were not dealing with the original Africa, but they were dealing with a distorted Africa. Maybe this is where I want to stop for now, but if you wanted to go on, I may go on. Right. <clears throat> I think well, that would make a, a conversation in itself. 
that would be really interesting. <laughs> You're ahead of me, Simon. I'm just about to invite Professor Sate to be our, our resident African professor expert. Is that all right, Professor Sate? Well, I hope I can do a little uh, to assist the project in this way. Uh, I will be glad to perform that role. Right, that would be wonderful if you can help us. You, um, Professor Sati was particularly helpful um, in uh, the last project Caroline and I were involved in, which was looking at the, uh, the use of a cloth called Welsh Plains, which was used for barter purposes in, uh, in West Africa. Um, and one of the things we found out, didn't we, Professor Sate, that it was difficult to find anything out about it. So that was, uh, um, but that was that was helpful, and we will find out more. And we're going to do um, a session about fabrics specifically, and uh, we're going to do something about bark cloth. Um, we, um, Simon's got a Ugandan contact who's going to speak about that. So that'll be a really interesting session. Now. Um, I've just been on the phone with our colleague Yasser Safari, and uh, he is just getting himself organised. It is very, very early in the morning in Jamaica. Um, so he's getting himself organised and he's going to join us in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to now say the thank yous. Then we're going to see um, uh, a video made by Yasser Safari that takes about five minutes. Um, and he's working with the youth in um, downtown Kingston. So the theme of the session this morning, the, today has really been about youth, um, about the students at the African Institute, um, and that's helped us to, to, to link also in with, uh, with the story that, uh, that Yassus tells there. So if he joins us, fine, if not. But what I'd like to say then in the thank yous is thank you all for being here. Absolutely brilliant. It was great to have some Salamatu Fada as uh, chair of the African, um, North Wales African Society. Brilliant to have you here, Professor Sati. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, responding at, I think, quite a short notice reminder. Um, uh, also, to um, obviously thank Simon and the team at Belong Nottingham who are helping so well. Thank you to my colleague yeah. Caroline for her help. And <laughs> thank you, Norbert. If I can just uh, add uh, to what the professor have said, you know, uh, what is interesting, what is interesting, uh, we came across, you know, um, a publishing 20 years ago, a slim book about the work of the missionaries when they came in Congo a century ago. And it's interesting to check the African perception of the European, especially through the yeah. nicknames they was given the way really they was they adapted to the, you know, most of the Belgium who came in Congo was uh, the, the the Dutch one, and you know how the Dutch names are difficult. So they try to nickname them uh, uh, by the way they want to portray them. For example, I can give an example of the first bishop of the Nongo. His uh, Dutch name was uh, Jean van Kawelaat, but in this native name, uh, van Kawelaat means a mad dog. So they was calling the bishop the mad dog. <laughs> but, but, and the perception also of uh, the European, who are they? Who are, com who are they coming from? Where yeah. they got you know, the kind of skin? So it wasn't uh, every time a very, very positive uh, painting. If I go back to our friend who showed us the painting in the beginning, if you see the way he tried to adapt the painting of, of Picasso, huh? it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, not only Picasso has his is way to to, 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 to see the African painting, but the opposite also. Now we got the opposite. <laughs> and to, the cause of, uh, of this message is very, very interesting. So, Professor, thank you very much for summarizing us this perception. But as I say, those perceptions, as Barack Obama said, every time when you got this shock of culture, shock of people, mm. each of them got this kind of perception, you know, 
through the language, through the painting, the songs. And so this is very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Norbert. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so I think what we'll do now is we're going to hear um, Dem Way De, um, which is um, uh, a video that was produced by Yasser Safari to um, uh, recognize the work that he's been doing in downtown Kingston. Um, one or two of you will have met Yasus previously, either um, when he's been touring in Wales or um, when he's been coming and joining us on these sessions. Um, so, Simon, if it's all right, can we have a look at that? Yes, I'm just uh, calling it up and then I will start sharing again. Well, when you've got that organised, it'll be a nice way to finish the session. Yasus, yep. says, um, the, the slide you showed earlier was the... Uh, um, the latest uh, release Yas has had of, um, of poetry, uh, spoken word um, production. There's some really well-known names on that uh, on that uh, track, on those tracks. And he's just released um, a beautiful um, song which uh, recognises Toots. And uh, that was a real sadness that Toots passed away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we uh, listen to this now, and maybe Yasus will pop up, and maybe you won't. Okay, here we go. Thank you. No, my you, me not free them weird. Flex them weird, them me no meds them weird. No, my you, me no free them weird. Me no check them weird, me no turn them weird. No, my you, me no move them weird. Me no flex them weird, me no fit meds them weird. When me see people, things me dey make it turn. Make it turn where? Make it turn. Me no yam no good food from last week Friday. Last week Friday. Last week Friday, and we still not get 50 until next week Sunday. Next week Sunday? Next week Monday. When you say I'm way left, I say next week Sunday. No, my you, me not free them weird. Me not check them weird. Me not turn them weird. No, my you, me not move them weird. Me not flex them weird. Me not make them weird. No, my you, me not free them weird. Check them weird, them me not turn them weird. No, my you, me no move them weird. Me no flex them weird, you no fit flex them weird. I me no interest if you go make no dopey. You no make no dopey, me no make no dopey. Me prefer pick a fruit and kiss the tree, plant a seed and let it be. One tree, one fruit, one seed, one card, one word, one deed. Tell me blue the bow on and say yes indeed. Yes indeed. Him say yes indeed. So why do you me no free them weird? Me no check them weird. Me no turn them weird. No my you me no move them weird. Me no flex them weird. Me no mess them weird. No my you me no free them weird. Me no check them weird. Me no turn them weird. No my you me no move them weird. Flex them weird, you know, if it makes them weird. Remember yesterday, today was tomorrow. And tomorrow, today becomes yesterday. So anything you see, I got you a go rip. And if you spit in a disguise, you can go drop in a yard. So no way you ascend, and no way you add it. And everything that you do, it come right back to you. And under the sun, nothing na new. Nothing na new. Nothing na new. So no, my you, me no free them weird. Me no check them weird. Me no turn them weird. No, my you, me no move them weird. Me no flex them weird. Me no make them weird. No, my you, me no free them weird. Me no check them weird. Me no turn them weird. No, my you, me no move them weird. Me no flex them weird. You no fit make them weird. When you see people things, you fit just make it done. Make it done, yeah. Me no, no, no good food from last week Friday. Last week Friday. 
last week Friday. And we still not get no key until next week Sunday. Next week Sunday? Next week Monday. Me say next week Sunday. No, but you, me not free them with them. Me check them with them. Me not pan them with them. No, but you, me not move them with them. Me flex them with them. Me not met them with them. No, my you, me not free them with them. Me check them with them. Me not pan them with them. No, my you, me not move them with them. Me not flex them with them. Me not met them with them. I me not interested if you make no dope. Make no dope, me prefer Pick a fruit and kiss the tree Plant a seed and let it be One tree, one fruit, one seed One heart, one word, one deed Can me blow the phone on and say yes, yes indeed. indeed Say what? Him say yes indeed, yes, indeed. No, my you, my me not pray them with them Me check them with them, me not turn them with them Okay, so that's a bit of a lesson in Jamaican as well. Um, and uh, just to say um, that uh, <laughs> it, it's a delight for me to see that because uh, some of you will realize that I've worked with Yasser Safari for about 10 years now, uh, sometimes organizing tours over here and sometimes having opportunities to work in Jamaica. And uh, when I was there about four years ago, he took me to meet the, the lads who are on that video um, and they've actually produced, um, developed that garden so that it's producing fresh produce for the cafe in downtown Kingston. So I did feel safe with, with Yasser's taking me to downtown Kingston, but I wouldn't go there on my own. Um, uh, so that was fantastic. So it looks as if um, we've not been able to, to get Yasser's uh, um, with us today, but uh, uh, not to worry, he's, he's joined us on other occasions and he will be joining us again. So what um, Simon and I talked about was that we're going to leave the, um, leave the chat on now for a few minutes so that we can catch up with people um, and you can ask any more questions and, uh, and see how, how things are going and, and give us some advice and guidance on what we can do next, perhaps. So if we stop the recording now, then, Simon, thanks.